So why should we be talking about butterflies today? Now, I know a couple of people dropped in the chat. They love, <laughs> they love watching butterflies. They love to learn about them. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. So a few things. They're beautiful, right? We love to dress up like butterflies. We love the way they look. They make us happy. Their life cycles are fascinating. This is a, a kid who's getting to release a monarch butterfly after having been raised in the nature center. It's a pretty special time. So we raise them, bring them, keep them safe in the nature center. And then when it's their time to be, they become adults and it's time for them to fly away. Sometimes people get to help us out, which is pretty awesome. It's a very cool way to see science and life cycles up close. And we love to look at them, right? They are so cool. But they're a lot more than that. They even, you know, in when we think about butterflies, sometimes they make us happy. Aristotle named butterflies um, psyche, which is kind of the root word of that. The Greek word is for the human soul. We thought that butterflies had something to do with the human soul, which I think is pretty awesome. But what I'm here tonight is to convince you there are a lot more than just beautiful butterflies, right? They are a cornerstone of our ecosystem. They play a huge role in um, how things work. And if they were to disappear, that would be a big problem. So here's our black capped chickadee, right? One of our favorite birds. And they wouldn't be around if we didn't have butterflies. And especially if we didn't have caterpillars. And if those chickadees aren't around, then our awesome red-tailed hawks wouldn't be around, right? And they do all kinds of things like get rid of mice. They do all sorts of things for our ecosystem. Butterflies also help us out with our flowers. So they're pollinating them, they're helping them grow. There's our white snake root and our common milkweed. So as we start to think about butterflies, we're gonna go back to science class, back to our roots so that we make sure we understand everything about them. So they're animals, right? They're arthropods, they have an exoskeleton. So their body is covered in a hard shell. Instead of having bones inside their body like we do, they have their bones on the outside. They're also invertebrates, so they don't have a backbone like we do. They have that hard shell that kind of keeps them solid. And they're also cold-blooded. So when it gets cold outside, a butterfly gets cold. They have some tricks up their sleeve to stay warm, um, but for the most part, whatever's going on around them, it affects them a little bit more than it does us, right? We're warm-blooded, so we can create our own body heat. As long as we keep eating, keep moving, we'll be okay. These guys are cold-blooded, so what's going on around them really affects them. They're insects. They're also in the order Lepidoptera. That is, if it's not a word you've said before, give it a shot. Lepidoptera. And what that means is scale wing, because their wings are covered in these modified hairs. They're so tiny, they're actually little scales. So that's our scale wings, Lepidoptera. That includes butterflies, skippers, and moths. They're all in the same family. So our butterflies, oh, make sure I got, oop, wanna do that. <laughs> this is a new, new tool for us, so we're learning all the time. Our butterflies, skippers, and moths, they all look a lot alike. A um, Couple of ways to tell them apart. So butterflies, usually at rest, they might have their wings out flat, behind them, or a lot of times they'll hold them behind them, straight behind them, behind their head. This guy's got his wings splayed. They oftentimes, their antenna are kind of, have those long antenna. They've got a club at the end. They're kind of long and slim with that round part at the end. They also have pretty slim bodies. Um, and so, and they're not too hairy. They, when they fly, um, they're often around during the day. Our skippers do that as well. Um, and their pupa, we're going to talk a little bit about their life cycle, but they usually just form a chrysalis. So our skippers are another group, and really they're a part of the butterflies, um, but they look pretty unique. They're kind of kind of their own little subset. So that guy in the middle, I think he's pretty cute. Um, they often, their antenna, often have kind of a little hook at the end. They look like a little crochet hook. They've got really big eyes for their body shape. So all of these guys have eyes, but skippers have particularly large ones for their body shape. They're great at seeing. And one of the reasons they have those big eyes is because they're actually really fast. These guys often are holding their, uh, holding their wings kind of at an angle behind them. So they don't quite have them straight back. They don't quite have them out flat to the sides. 
a little bit at an angle. And they often have these big, thick, heavy bodies, kind of hairy bodies. Um, and uh, those are our skippers. They're a, little, a lot smaller. And then we have our moths. Now, a lot of times you might think butterflies and skippers fly during the day, moths fly at night. Not always true. Just like anything in nature, some of them break the rules. Um, so there are a lot of common moths we might see during the day. A lot of them are evening flyers. Um, this guy, the polyphemus moth, they actually fly really, really early in the morning. So the adults are almost impossible to find in the wild unless you're in the right place. You might find a caterpillar a little more likely, but their caterpillars even are way up in the trees. So they're pretty difficult to find. So these guys, often, are, um, often the moths are flying at night. They've got those really stout, thick bodies. You can see he almost looks furry. Um, and that maybe that helps keep them warm when they're flying at night. All, they also have these crazy feathery antenna that I think is pretty awesome. So when we're looking at our butterfly family, all of these guys, a lot of the things we're gonna talk about today, they all kind of go together. They're all related, um, but there are a couple different groups. So our moths, as we said, a lot of times their antenna are pretty wild. They might look like a corkscrew, they might be long and wiry, or they might have these wild feathery antenna, like that guy on the side of your screen. I think he's so cute. Um, but those feathery antenna, often the males have them, and they actually are meant so that they can pick up pheromones in, in case of a female. So it, it helps them helps them find each other. Our moths are also have lots of colors. They're pretty fascinating. This is a rosy maple moth. This is one of my favorite caterpillars. Uh, the caterpillars are called a hickory horn devil. And I've seen these guys be uh, almost hot dog size. They get huge. That's one of the things I think is awesome about this whole, the Lepidoptera family is there is crazy diversity. Um, they all look a little bit different. They all have kind of their own niche. And uh, I bet you didn't know that there was hot dog shaped caterpillars. They're pretty awesome. So these guys obviously have horns to um, help protect themselves. And these guys, this hickory horn devil, or the, the adults are known as the royal walnut moth, and they're also beautiful. They actually go underground for the winter. So they live here in Northeast Ohio, especially probably a little bit further south where there's lots of open space um, down in the national park, that area. But these guys spend most of the summer eating and eating and eating. And then once it's about, it's getting to be late summer and whatever cues they're looking out for tells them the time is right. They actually burrow down under the ground, down below the frost line. And that's where they're gonna make their chrysalis underground, which is pretty wild. And then in the, in the summer, after things warm up, they'll climb out and become an adult. Here is a um, moth um, cocoon. So a lot of times our butterflies just form what we would say is a naked chrysalis, just that hard shell. But our moths, many of them form a silk cocoon. And so they actually have spinnerets, kind of like a spider. They can make the silk and can form themselves, um, create themselves a safe place to be for the winter or even during the summer um, as they go through their change. They might use these leaves like you can see around them. Um, when we've had them in the nature center, some of these guys will even make part of their cocoon with a paper towel that was on the bottom of their cage. Um, they're pretty, they, they use whatever tool is around them. There is our skippers. I just think they're adorable. Um, so this guy is, they're usually pretty tiny. Oftentimes their colors are not as bright as what you might expect for butterfly. So this guy is kind of brown and yellow. Some of them are black and white. Um, they've got these great big eyes. Um, and one of the reasons I think they probably have these great big eyes is they are super, super fast. So these guys are tiny. A lot of them are quarter sized or even smaller, way smaller, um, maybe the size of your thumb, but they can fly 37 miles per hour. It's pretty crazy, it's pretty fast. Most butterflies go like five to 10 miles an hour. Um, a lot of butterflies are not built for speed. These guys are, they're on the move, which I think is pretty awesome. So as we start to think a little bit more 
about our butterflies, it's also important that we know what we're looking for and a little bit about their bodies. So our butterflies have um, antenna and these help them with all kinds of things. They help with direction. They help them figure out their how long the days are. So what time of day? Is it time to go to my hiding place for the night? Um, is it is the day almost over? Is it time to wake up? What's going on? Um, they help them with balance. So these guys are often flying through. They're often flying through um, maybe wind or a storm. And so their antenna will help them figure out which way they should be oriented in case they get blown off course and with navigation. So I'm sure you know monarch butterflies migrate 2,000 miles every single year, pretty crazy. And they need those antenna to help them find their direction and figure out which way they're going. There have been some studies of butterflies that lost their antenna and they really just weren't able to find their way home, weren't able to find um, the patch of flowers they were going to. It's a really important part of their body. Let's see, other body parts of butterflies. We've got our forewing and hindwing. So these guys, all, all our butterflies, moths and skippers all have four wings. Two in the front, two in the back, and they all work together. So these guys are very muscular. They their wings actually kind of beat in a figure eight motion, and that helps them, you know, move and change speed, change direction in midair, move pretty quick. A lot of them. Those veins, those lines you see on their wings, actually help with the blood flow. So just like we have arteries and veins through our body that helps our heart pumps blood out to different parts of our body. So do the butterflies all the way through their wings. And then that little, little I'm not sure if you can see um, my note on the bottom, but those little tails on the end of their wings, I just wanted to point out because those are swallowtails. So this guy is a spice for swallowtail. I'm gonna talk about him a lot. He is one of my favorite butterflies. Um, and he's got kind of those cute little black tails on the end of his wing. And that's a group of butterflies known as the swallowtails have all those little, those little tails on the end of their wing. That's a good way to see them. So other body parts of our butterfly, this beautiful side view, we've got his antenna. You can see they're curved. These guys are curved a little bit. Every single butterfly has a little bit of a different, their antenna look a little different. They also have these compound eyes. So their eyes have 6,000 lenses. That's crazy, right? So we just have one, we, we've got, got our eye, and our eye is, isn't that simple, but their compound eyes allow them to see all around them. They can see almost behind them, everything in front of them, and then all those different views come together to help them figure out where they're going quickly, right, what they wanna do. They also have a proboscis. So a butterfly mouth is not like our mouth at all. <laughs> they have this long, almost like a tongue, um, and so you can see that long, long wire coming out of his mouth, that's his proboscis. And it's kind of like a straw with a sponge on the end. So they can dab it, you know, in the flower, they might stick it in um, this, this wild bergamot, they could stick it down those tubes way down there to catch the nectar that's all the way at the bottom. And to lap that up so that way they don't have to stick their whole head in the butter in the flower um, they can reach their long tongue down in there pretty awesome there's some moths that have a proboscis that is like several inches long crazy and when they're not using it it just kind of rolls right up almost like a fruit by the foot or a fruit roll up these guys also have six legs they're insects so those legs help them climb around right. And because they're insects, they also have three body parts. They've got a head, that's where brain, compound eyes, antenna, all that stuff is. The thorax, the middle of the body, and that's where your wings are attached and your legs are attached. Lots of mus muscles in there. And then the abdomen, the bottom part, and that's kind of where a lot of your digestive system, um, that's where the female would make eggs, all those kinds of things. They've got all these body parts. And, and this picture is a good way to see really the four wings and the hind wings, that they do have four, four wings. Um, a lot of times when they're moving, butterflies move fast. And it can be hard. It is hard to get a good picture of a butterfly. I try a lot. Um, but it is very cool to see in this picture. You know, you can see their four wings and their hind wings a little bit better. And you can see that their color is a little bit different on the 
um, the back side of his wings, it, he only has blue spots. And then on the other side, he's got, underside, he's got some orange spots. So each butterfly, their color is a little bit different as well. So when we think about our butterfly life cycle, also important, every single part, right? The female will lay an egg, usually underneath, maybe underneath a leaf, always on their host plant. Okay? And then once that egg hatches, a caterpillar comes out. Oftentimes they eat that egg. That's kind of their first source of nutrition that their mom leaves for them. And the caterpillar's job is to eat and eat and eat. So he's going to eat a little bit. Once he gets a little bit too big for his skin, remember they've got, they've got an exoskeleton. So their skin is, is, does not grow with them like ours does. Once he gets a little too big, he's going to shed his skin, just peel it off, almost like you, if you peeled off a sock and then eat a little bit more and then shed his skin and then eat a little bit more, shed his skin. And each of those different sheds of their skin, we call instars. So if you had a monarch caterpillar, for instance, you could tell how old he was by how long his antenna are, how big he is, because every single one grows the same way. And that's a way for us to, to keep track of how long they've been around, how long they've been growing. Now, as we look at this caterpillar, it might be a little tricky on, on this picture, but caterpillars do have six legs, just like our adults. Um, I can't see his, his normal legs. They're kind of up front. So if you look at that caterpillar picture, he's got two antenna up top. Underneath those, kind of tucked underneath him, he's got his six legs that kind of have, have little claws on them. But then behind that, he's got a bunch of pro legs, all of these kind of soft, fleshy knobs. And those are special for caterpillars just so that they can hang on to leaves. So they, they can hold on and they are very, very sticky. Some of them are stickier than others. Um, but that way they hold on if there's a windstorm, if somebody's trying to move you from the leaf that you're trying to eat, they can hold on and um, just eat and eat and eat and eat. It's pretty cool. So once our caterpillar is done growing, once he's big enough, it's time to form a chrysalis. And the coolest thing I think about their chrysalis is they actually are shedding their skin again and what's inside is the chrysalis. It's much more complicated than that, um, but what's inside, so this is our monarch butterfly. There's, and this green chrysalis is pretty awesome. I see I had a, a chat from Anna. I, under, I understand that the words that are, are not exact, um, we are using closed captioning so that we're able to be accessible in the future. So it's not going to be exact, but hopefully it helps out a little bit. But thanks for the note. And then once our chrysalis is done on the inside of that chrysalis, this caterpillar pretty much turns into goo. Um, and everything kind of rearranges. They're going through this complete metamorphosis. And then once that time is up, depending, could be a week or two, could be a lot of our butterflies stay in their chrysalis or stay in their cocoon all winter long. And once that time is up, they're gonna, sh again, shed that skin. So all, all that's left over is that the external plastic, plasticky bit and what's left inside, and then our adult will come out. They've got to kind of inflate their wings. Um, it takes a while. They don't just emerge from the chrysalis as a full grown adult. Um, they need to kind of inflate those wings with liquid that was in their body. They push it out through the wings, dry off a little bit, kind of get their, get their muscles moving, and then they're good to go. Pretty amazing. So I always think of our caterpillars, our eating machines, and then our adults, their job is to lay eggs. So a lot of the adult butterflies, moths, cat, moths, skippers, don't live for very long. Some of them might live a few days. Some of them, you know, a monarch butterfly who's migrating could live for nine or 10 months. But really their job is to um, get together and lay eggs. So we love our caterpillars. And here's just a couple good pictures of our monarch caterpillars. They start out really, really tiny, eat and eat and eat, get bigger, shed their skin, eat and eat and eat, get bigger, shed their skin, right? Going through every single instar. And our caterpillars really are vital. This is kind of a part of the story. I know I, I talked earlier about butterflies are beautiful, butterflies bring us joy, but really if caterpillars were gone, our entire world would change. One pair of songbird parents, I think this study was with a pair of chickadees in somebody's backyard, they can bring to their caterpillars 
that bring to their young 400 to 600 caterpillars a day. So a pair of chickadees, mom and dad, they might have three to five babies in a nest box or in a nest, and they're bringing them food over and over and over again all day long. Um, on average, this study, they saw the parents bringing their babies a caterpillar every three minutes, which is kind of crazy. I, I don't think, you know, I know I couldn't find a caterpillar every three minutes. Um, but that means that they're finding 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars every time that they have babies. So our chickadees often will have two clutches every year. Sometimes if it's good weather year, these guys might have three clutches per year. That is a lot of caterpillars, right? That's wild. So that's this bluebird. Think about how many caterpillars this bluebird has got to find. And you know, when I think about even in my yard, or if you are a person who has a yard and um, works to make sure it's a hospitable place for wildlife, could you find, could a pair of bluebirds find 10,000 caterpillars in your yard? I don't know, it's something to think about. And to be fair, these guys are made to find caterpillars. They work really hard. They've got the eyesight, right? It is the best thing for them to find all that food for their young. Um, but we also wanna make sure that we have a habitat for them that's got what they need. So these guys are often eating caterpillars um, partially because they're big, they're soft. Think about what a baby eats, right? Soft food, that is the easiest thing for these baby birds to eat. They're nutritious. There is a low percent of chitin. There's not, not really any hard stuff in their bodies that's gonna be hard for those babies to digest. And it is the best source of carotenoids, an important nutrient for them during this breeding season. It's the easiest thing to find, tons and tons of caterpillars. You know, baby birds can't eat seeds. They're not ready for that yet. So their mom and dad are bringing them caterpillars over and over and over again, right? So here's a couple baby bluebirds from one of our nest boxes and they're very hungry and I'm sure they had lots and lots of caterpillars to eat. But when we think about these bluebirds and the caterpillars, that's when I say that these guys are kind of a cornerstone of the ecosystem. If the bluebirds or the other songbirds weren't around, we wouldn't have hawks and everything else would kind of fall apart. So we wanna make sure that we have lots and lots of caterpillars for all these guys to eat. Now just a couple notes about caterpillar diversity. There's a ton of different caterpillars, just like a ton of different butterflies and moths and skippers, right? You know, some of these guys um, all stay together in a group. They're social. If you've ever seen um, even gypsy moths or other kinds of moths that kind of are in groups, a lot of times they'll all form this group. I have flipped over a leaf before that has holes in it. And all of a sudden all the caterpillars are like shaking in unison at me. So sometimes they have behaviors that I think are pretty hilarious and kind of wild, right? Sometimes they've got great camouflage. This guy is trying really, really, really hard to make you think he's part of the plan. And he's doing a pretty good job. Sometimes they just look crazy. This is a, a kind of slug moth, right? And I think if I was looking for a caterpillar to eat, I think I would leave that alone. I don't think I would mess with it. And then a lot of caterpillars, especially our moth caterpillars, have all of these hairs. Um, they might have warning coloration. So anything in nature, especially these guys that's bright colored, usually is telling you, leave me alone. I taste bad. Or I'm not going to feel very good if you swallow me. So these guys, these hairs on them, a lot of times can be pretty irritating. And that's when I know I've got a couple parents with me today, but people always ask me, is it okay to touch caterpillars? Most of them, probably, yes, be gentle. But a lot of times those hairs, especially on this guy, might irritate your skin. So if they're really fuzzy, I would leave them alone. Leave that for another day, right? So this is our spotted tussock moth, is that big hairy guy, and he's got both worn and coloration. He's saying, leave me alone, and he's got all those hairs. Now, the interesting thing about butterflies is all of these ways caterpillars have to keep themselves safe, right? Maybe they're in a big group, they're kind of social, doing the social thing. Maybe they've got good camouflage, they've got worn and coloration. Um, there's still birds that are gonna eat them. There are, you know, a uh, yellow-billed cuckoo will eat almost anything, doesn't matter. Some of these guys also can secrete a kind of acid from their body to make them taste bad. Um, and so that these guys won't 
won't mess with them anymore. Some of them have these crazy protrusions that come out of their body that just like appear almost like, like an octopus tentacle or an octopus arm um, that can make shapes. So caterpillars are pretty wild. This is one of my favorite guys. Again, the spice bush swallowtail. I just love them. And he is a great mimic his whole life. So we talked about um, butterfly eggs, tiny, usually white, greenish, clear under a leaf. It's a good way to stay safe. But this is the caterpillar of a spice bush swallowtail. Now, I don't know about you. I think it looks like bird poop. Um, and I think that's the point. So they, no bird is going to mess with it right? So they, over time, will shed their skin, um, eat a little bit more, shed their skin. And every single instar, every step step of growth is a little bit different. This guy, one of the later instars, this is still the spice bush swallowtail, turns green and he's got those little eye spots. So what this does is these guys tend to, they have a little bit of silk, they'll roll themselves up into a leaf. And usually at night, that's where they hang out or at night, that's that's where they'll leave and they'll go out to eat during the day. They're eating during the day, come back in to hide at, at um, they'll go, sorry, they'll go out to eat at night, come back to hide during the day. And if I opened a rolled up leaf and saw that green guy looking back at me, I don't think I'd mess with it. I think I'd leave it alone. We think a lot of birds might take a peek at that, take a peek at those yellow spots, those are not his eyes. Caterpillars just have really simple eyes. They can really just tell light and dark. They don't see very well at all. But that maybe they think it's like a, a green snake, some kind of snake or some somebody that's hiding in there they don't want to mess with. It's a pretty cool form of mimicry to help them stay safe. And then these guys, even when they're adults, they are mimics. So this is our beautiful spice bush swallowtail again. And his coloring is almost exactly like another butterfly called a pipevine swallowtail. Now, pipevine, spice bush, they're named after these plants. Usually it's a plant you would find them on a lot. Spice bush swallowtail often use, lays its eggs. Caterpillars are eating spice bush, great native shrub. Pipevine is also a plant that the pipevine swallowtail is often eating. And pipevine is a little bit poisonous. So the pipevine swallowtail caterpillars and adults are a little poisonous, and if you're a bird, you try to eat them, they're not going to taste very good. This guy, this spice bush swallowtail, he's not poisonous at all. He's just pretending. He's saying, hey, I'm going to use my Batesian mimicry and pretend I'm the poisonous guy. Hopefully you'll leave me alone. Seems to work. However, we know that birds are also smart, and I am sure a lot of these guys also get eaten. Just how nature works, right? You try and try and try. This is our giant swallowtail. So that's his caterpillar, which is even crazier, right? And then here is his chrysalis, which I think is pretty cool. So, you know, we're used to the monarch chrysalis, which is bright green, kind of gold. Um, this guy is a little bit more camouflage. So these guys might be, you know, during the winter, look like a dead leaf hanging off a plant. Um, and I don't think you would know that there was anything in there. And then there's our giant swallowtail, beautiful, beautiful butterfly. So, you know, as we think about these guys, their host plants and their nectar plants are really important. Host plant is where the mama butterfly is gonna lay her eggs and what the caterpillars are gonna eat. And then these, so that's really important. A lot of these guys might have very specific host plants. They can only live on one thing, um, or some of them, you know, can, their caterpillars can live on almost anything. You know, sometimes if we're raising caterpillars in the nature center, we'll offer a couple different options and see what they like. Um, usually the caterpillars don't really have a choice in what they're gonna eat, right? Whatever mom lays you on, that's kind of where you're there especially when you think about many of these caterpillars are living way up in the tops of trees in our forest. So we talked a little bit about how many caterpillars could you find in your yard. These guys are hard to find. They are way up there. Um, and so a lot of them we're not going to see. And they're just going to be, if, you, if your egg is laid in an oak tree, probably going to be in that oak tree for your whole life, right? But because these host plants and nectar plants are so important, they need to have the right thing. So if I just or any random old flower, that might not be the thing this, this butterfly needs. 
Um, and so we want to make sure that they're getting the things that they need. So there is our monarch butterfly laying eggs underneath the leaf. She found some common milkweed. She's got chemoreceptors. It's kind of a crazy thing. Um, and so they're on her antenna, kind of her sense of taste almost. On her antenna, she can tell a little bit what's going on around her. And then also on her legs, they can feel with their legs. Is this the right plant? Is this where I'm supposed to be? And um, really, it's pretty amazing that they can, can feel that and figure out whether this is the plant that their caterpillar should be laid on. Okay. And there's our pipe vine swallowtail who is visiting a button bush. This is another awesome native plant. Um, I challenge you when butter, button bush is in bloom, I bet you, I don't think I've ever found less than five pollinators on button bush. It is a workhorse, it's a great plant. Um, and so there's a lot of these plants that we know really play a huge role in supporting this insect life, which in turn supports everything else. You know, oak trees in, especially in Northeast North America can support 557 species of caterpillars. That's crazy, crazy, right? We don't have that many species around here. We have 70 to 80 species of caterpillars in Northeast Ohio. Um, but overall, knowing that these oak trees play a huge role in supporting our butterflies. You know, these native plants are really our bird feeders. They're raising these caterpillars, which raise, become butterflies. And even though a lot of them might get eaten by birds, that's okay. That's a, that's a part of the world too. You know, our, if you have a yard full of introduced plants or non-native plants, oftentimes they might have 75% less caterpillars. Um, and that means that birds that you might want to have in your yard, might want to have nesting in your yard, they might not choose that because they're not going to have, they're not going to be able to find the food they need for their young. But the world of butterflies has changed. So this is a butterfly known as the West Virginia White, beautiful little spring flyer. And this is the plant that it loves to eat. This is two-leaved toothwort. It's a pretty common spring wildflower in our forests. So we find butterflies both in our meadows um, and around our wetlands and sometimes in the forest too. It's called two-leaf toothwort and it's in the mustard family, huge family of plants, lots and lots of those guys. Um, unfortunately, two-leaf toothwort, we're seeing a lot less of nowadays. And it's because of this guy. This is garlic mustard. I'm sure if you have ever been on a spring program with a naturalist, you know about garlic mustard, um, but this is an invasive plant. And so it kind of has spread, it's, it's from Europe, and it has spread all throughout a lot of places in our yards, a lot of places in our parks, it spreads really, really quickly. And um, this is one of the reasons it's not so good because it's in the mustard family, just like the two-leaf toothwort. However, it spreads really fast, number one, makes tons and tons of seeds, will take over in just a couple years. Um, so the two-leaf toothwort doesn't have as much space, but also, this West Virginia white butterfly doesn't know the difference between the two plants. So she might lay her eggs on this mustard plant, this garlic mustard, thinking she's doing the right thing, and then the babies aren't able to survive. It's sad. And so, so we need to make sure that we have lots of habitat for these plants, the two-leaf toothwort, and that we're getting rid of plants that actually are destructive, like this garlic mustard. Now, what do these guys do in winters? A whole host of things, right? Our monarch butterflies, they migrate. So we're lucky enough to be here right on the shores of Lake Erie that we see thousands and thousands and thousands of monarch butterflies passing through. They spent their summer up in Canada in the fall, you know, and, and move through. Most years, um, we just see a lot of butterflies. They'll stop by after flying over the lake get some nectar, kind of, you know, fill up their tanks for the rest of their journey down to Mexico. Um, some years, like this picture, in the fall, usually it's when there's a big weather event. So oftentimes in the middle of September, if there's big rainstorm, kind of cold, the butterflies that are moving from over, from over the lake all kind of stuck. So they're all going to hunker down, find a place to hang out for a few days until it's, it's gone. And that's when we see these huge migrations. So I know they are way cool. It is very cool to see these. And um, Cleveland Metro Parks is usually all over social media when the butterflies are right like at Wendy Park. When they're in huge numbers, um, we'll let you know. But most years, 
we do see a lot of butterflies. They're just moving through. Some years we just get lucky enough to have tons and tons of them. And what they're doing is they're hanging out, waiting for the weather to be gone, getting it hope, looking for a little bit of fuel. So we want to make sure we, we've got lots of plants for them to nectar on um, until it's, it's time to move a little bit further south. But so that's what our monarchs do. There's a tag on a monarch. We do a lot of monarch tagging, just a little sticker, light little sticker. And um, that way, in case they're caught later, maybe when they're in Mexico, they researchers are able to figure out where they came from. But there are so many monarch butterflies that they will never will never find most of them. So we try to tag as many as we can. Hopefully they can find a few. So these guys migrate and we have some other butterflies. Um, some of our swallowtails usually will migrate. They might migrate not quite as far, just a little bit. But a lot of these guys have to deal with winter just like the rest of us, right? So most of our butterflies, skippers, moths will overwinter in their cocoon or their chrysalis. That was our giant swallowtail chrysalis. Um, and so they might be under the leaf litter. They might be stuck on the side of a plant um, in a nice safe place. And then once things warm up again and there's things to eat, because remember what are butterflies eating? Nectar from flowers when they're an adult, right? Or green growing plants. If you're a caterpillar, you got to make sure there's food for you to eat. So you're going to be in diapause in a deep hibernation all winter long until spring, to late springtime, early summer, when there's things to eat again. Some of these guys, you're right, Kimberly, that's a morning cloak. Some of these guys, like our morning cloak, actually overwinter as adults, which I think is wild. So they might find a place, burrow under the leaves, um, where they can be nice and warm, and they'll kind of also go into this diapause, go into hibernation almost as, as an adult until it's warm enough. So these guys, especially the morning cloak, Sometimes you will see if we have a warm string of days um, early, early in the spring, you'll see them flying around, kind of crazy. Some of these guys do, you know, as you start to learn about butterflies, identifying them is really tricky. So these are actually two different kinds of butterflies. At first glance, they look almost exactly the same. And I'm going to show you um, how butterfly nerds sum apart. So on the left-hand side, um, we have an eastern comma, and then on the right-hand side is a question mark. This is how we know. On the bottom side of their wings, there is a little silvery white mark that the comma is just kind of a little half circle, and on the question mark is kind of a little half circle with a dot that maybe you could maybe imagine is kind of a question mark. Um, one of my favorite things about butterflies is their names. I think they're just so entertaining. Um, so this comma and this question mark, and these are actually two of the butterflies that overwinter as adults too. And you can see if you look at those butterflies that they definitely could look like a dry up leaf, right? They'd be pretty safe for sure. All right, a couple other butterflies. Here's our leaf skipper, very cute. Our silver spotted skipper, also pretty awesome. This is a really common guy. Pearl Crescent is one of my favorites, tiny, 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 little orange and black butterfly. Um, I always think their back looks like, like a quilt, like I wanna, wanna sew something with that on it. Red Admiral, really common butterfly as well. Our sulfurs, see these guys a lot in our meadows. Eastern Hill Blue. Spice Fish Swallowtail, my favorite. So just a reminder, you know, if you are interested in having more butterflies at home, there's a lot you can do. There's some plants that we know kind of have an outsized effect, um, like this butterfly weed, the orange flower. Um, this guy had, it's got a pipe fine swallowtail on it, a couple hair streaks. There's some plants that almost any butterfly would like to visit. And even in a small patch of yard, like your tree lawn, um, you can really create a great habitat for butterflies. and create things for you to look at, things for you to enjoy, but also really support the ecosystem around you. A couple of resources to support you if you wanna keep learning about butterflies or um, even more about native plants. The Ohio Lepidopterists are a really awesome group. Um, and actually one of the very cool things about the Ohio Lepidopterists 
they have volunteers who walk routes. So they'll walk a trail maybe in their yard or in a public park and they have been and look for butterflies and keep track of that. And they've been doing that for like 25 years. That is actually like the best set of butterfly data in the country. So using that information from the Ohio lepidopterists that all those volunteers gathered, um, there was a national study and they were able to learn a lot about how butterfly populations are changing. Unfortunately, what they learned is that our butterfly populations are losing about 2% a year, which adds up to like 30% loss in the last 25 years. It was awful. And a lot of that is loss of habitat, loss of the plants that they need, certainly use of pesticides is a piece of that as well. Um, but that research is really important. So I'm sure they're always looking for volunteers and they have county lists. So they'll tell you what butterflies are common exactly in your county where you live and when they might be flying, which is pretty awesome. Butterflies of Ohio, great book. They're organized by color, which I think is helpful as you get started, look up an orange butterfly and they're gonna be local, all things you find in Ohio. And then the Ohio Division of Natural Resources has field guides that, you know, when the nature centers are open, we always, we often have for you, but also you can download them. Um, so they're on the website, check them out. They also have some great ones of, about um, even having butterflies at home, that kind of thing. And then Doug Talame is really the leading author on um, creating native plants in your yard, creating your own native ecosystem. He's got a great resource. So just a reminder, butterflies are more than flowers that fly. They're a really important part of our ecosystem and um, they bring us a whole lot. Be awesome. So let's take a look and see. I, I see some people have been answering questions in the chat. If you have anything else to ask, um, feel free to do that now. Yep, caterpillars of Eastern North, Eastern North America. This is a great resource. Thanks everybody. So please, we'd love to have you join us for the rest of our um, School of the Wilds. We're gonna be going at least into March. Um, next week, my coworker, Jeff Reby is gonna be sharing about fantastic fish. And even though you might not know a lot about fish, I promise you he will show you some awesome fish and um, he can teach you about them in a way that will keep you interested. They are very, very cool. I'm sure there's a lot to learn. Um, Marty Calabrese will be back January 30th talking about the mighty chestnut tree. Um, and then I'll be back sharing about amphibians. So we would love to have you join us again. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me by email. That's sjm1 at clevelandmetroparks.com. And you will be emailed a link to our um, program evaluation after the program that we would love to hear any thoughts you have. So thanks everybody, have a great night.